So thank you everyone for joining us today for a discussion of the crisis in policing. Three weeks ago, our country was horrified by the brutal killing of George Floyd. Since then, a deep national, even international conversation has begun about the many dimensions of racial justice in our society. George Floyd's death by the Minneapolis Police Department comes after a sequence of other deaths of African Americans at the hands of the police that have been the focus of public attention in recent years. A centerpiece, therefore, of the conversation about racial justice has been about police conduct. These deaths have and should spark a sense of moral outrage. These deaths were committed by police, and it is police who ought to enforce our laws and be the front lines of justice. In addition to moral outrage, these killings have brought forth fundamental questions about the nature and structure of policing in our country. These fundamental questions about policing haven't been so prominent in our country for a long time, or perhaps ever. Questions such as what kinds of reforms should occur? Should licensing schemes or the ending of qualified immunity occur? Others dispute that any reforms are adequate and instead ask that police be disbanded or defunded. It is accurate to say that there is a crisis in policing at this time. And at this moment, many are wondering, what are the roles that we want to assign to police? Or what tasks should we have armed police for? And if we agree on a proper role of police, what specific changes to policing should occur to bring us to that proper role? And why have these changes not happened already? What are the obstacles to making these changes? How can these obstacles be overcome such that steps towards more just policing can now happen? Our country appears to be at an inflection point. And for the generation of law students in school today, it is, it is a defining moment. These are complex challenges and to meet them, Expertise from people who have worked and currently do work on the issues of policing, and in particular have worked in remedying injustices caused by police and worked to make policing more fair prospectively is needed. Also needed is the knowledge of those who have studied policing and the laws and regulations and institutions that shape police behavior. Universities are in a distinct position to provide this knowledge and to serve as a venue for thoughtful and meaningful discussions. And within universities, law schools have a very special role to play because police are the primary mechanism for enforcing our laws. We are fortunate at the University of Chicago Law School to have faculty members with these experiences and with this knowledge. I thank all of them for joining us today as members of the panel and as commentators. And I now turn the program over to Richard McAdams. Professor McAdams is also our Deputy Dean, and he is a leading expert on criminal law, criminal procedure, and criminal justice. And I want to thank Professor McAdams for organizing this event. It is through his creativity and his energy that this event is happening. And I also want to point out the unique and special nature of this event. This is the first webinar we have held that brings together students and faculty and staff and brings together also the incoming students in our JD class, the members of the class of 2023, and incoming members of our LLM class, the class of 2021, as well as many members of our alumni community. I thank all of you for joining us today, and I now turn it over to Professor McAdams. Uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, as a teacher and a scholar of criminal law uh, with great concerns for the longstanding crisis in policing, I'm happy to be moderating uh, an extremely impressive panel of colleagues today, uh, people who are deeply knowledgeable about policing issues. Before I introduce them, I, let me describe our program and our, our format. Uh, we'll proceed in two parts. Uh, first, the five faculty speakers will make opening remarks of seven uh, minutes each. Second, we will take questions from attendees. Uh, 
and I will bring in another group of faculty to join the speakers in answering the questions you pose. Uh, for those who haven't been in a Zoom webinar before, this differs from a Zoom meeting because the only videos and microphones that are activated are those for the host and panelists. But there's a critically important feature by which uh, you can ask a question, which is the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use it. Uh, as I expect, we may get uh, possibly hundreds of questions. I apologize if we do not get to yours, but we want your questions. Now I will introduce our panelists in the order in which uh, they will speak. Professor John Rappaport joined the law school in 2013, a short time after completing his clerkship with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. He teaches a variety of criminal law subjects and has written highly innovative scholarship on a wide range of policing subjects to wide acclaim. You will see him quoted these days in uh, many media and uh, uh, social media and conventional media on policing. Professor Craig Futterman founded the Civil Rights and Police Accountability Project at the law school's Mandel Legal Aid Clinic in 2000 and has been its clinical director for these 20 years. Few lawyers have litigated on issues involving the Chicago Police Department more than Professor Futterman. He has never not been busy that I know of, but he has been extraordinarily busy in these recent days. Our graduate, Professor Sharon Fairley, specializes in her past work and current teaching in issues of governmental transparency and integrity, especially as it concerns policing. Shortly before she joined the law school, she served as the inaugural director of the Chicago Civilian Office of Police Accountability, helping to build it from scratch, uh, uh, this project which began in 2016. Professor Claudia Flores is a graduate of the college and has directed our International Human Rights Clinic for the past five years. And just two days ago, the clinic released a momentous report, years in the making, entitled Deadly Discretion, the Failure of Police Use of Force Policies to Meet Fundamental International Human Rights Law and Standards. Professor Aziz Huck is a preeminent constitutional law scholar with a particular interest in civil rights and policing, having taught and written about the Fourth Amendment, police profiling, and anti-terrorism practices. Due to a prior Zoom commitment that could not be moved, Professor Huck is not with us yet, but will join us in about 20 minutes. And now let's begin with Professor Rappaport. All right, first mistake of the Zoom webinar, I was still muted. Uh, I said, thanks for the, for the lovely introduction, Tom and Richard. Um, I thought what I would do, since I have the pleasure of um, speaking first, is to try to do a little table setting. Um, you know, it's amazing to see the energy uh, out in the streets and, and online, um, and, and there's a lot uh, of praise we could heap upon it, but one thing um, that the slogans, defund the police, abolish the police, um, uh, do is they also obscure, I think, the complexity of uh, the legal regulation of the police. If, if we were to wake up tomorrow and there is no more police, then maybe we don't need to worry about these things. But unless and until that happens, I think it's good for us and especially for um, the audience members who are current and future lawyers um, to develop a better sense of all the many, many uh, uh, sources of legal regulation in this area. So I wrote down some notes and it turned into to quite a long list. Uh, and so, since I only have six minutes left, I'll have to go through it quickly. Um, but I broke it down first into to federal, state, and local law. And, and I, I, the main point of my comments is just to convey the, the complexity, the overlapping responsibility here, and all the different levers that we can and need to pull on um, if we want to change the way police behave. So if you think about federal law, uh, the federal government uh, supplies a lot of funding for local law enforcement, um, and often they earmark that funding, and, and that influences how the dollars are used, and therefore influences how policing is practiced on the ground. Federal law uh, defines the scope of Fourth Amendment rights, Fourth Amendment protections, 
which then uh, define, along with other legal doctrines, um, a criminal defendant's ability to prevail on an exclusionary motion that uh, alleges a violation of the Fourth Amendment and also defines a civil rights plaintiff's ability to prevail on a lawsuit alleging something like uh, excessive force. The federal government uh, also is in charge of so-called pattern or practice lawsuits. There's a federal statute that empowers the United States Department of Justice to sue local law enforcement agencies for a pattern or practice of legal violations. And they often enter into very detailed consent decrees that can be useful in reforming police departments. Uh, the Obama administration was much more active in this regard than the Trump administration has been. But this is a potentially important federal lever. And then the federal government also leads in a lot of data collection efforts. And these have been um, really flagging to date. And um, a large portion of the proposed Justice in Policing Act that was put forth by uh, a group of senators um, some time ago is geared toward data collection um, because it's hard to know which police departments um, are problematic and what kinds of problems they're having if we don't have better data than we have right now. When you come down to the state level, um, again, you have a lot of state level funding of local law enforcement. Uh, state law is also the licensing uh, body for law enforcement officers. You actually need a license in almost every state uh, to practice. And um, in, if you think about a lot of other areas of our lives, if you saw a member of a profession um, uh, repeatedly uh, committing misconduct, like say a lawyer, the lawyer keeps stealing money from his clients. You would think, you know, where is the bar association on this? Why aren't they doing something about it? Well, there exist similar bodies for police officers, but in most states, they've been pretty inactive to date. And this is an area I think um, people should be paying attention to going forward. State law often imposes damages caps on the amount of uh, tort damages that you can recover against a police officer uh, if you're making something other than a constitutional claim. State labor law uh, determines whether police officers can bargain collectively and what they can bargain over, including whether they can bargain over disciplinary procedures that affect our ability to hold them accountable. Civil service law does something similar. A lot of states have something called a law enforcement officer bill of rights, which is a statutory set of special procedural protections that again, make it uh, more difficult to hold police officers accountable when accused of misconduct. And then the substantive criminal law itself has a lot to do with policing because when we choose to criminalize something, to put it in our criminal code rather than somewhere else in our statutory code, we are empowering uh, police officers to attend to that problem. And we're telling them this is part of your charge. And that's a lot, I think, of, of, of what these conversations about defunding the police are actually about is, uh, you know, not all these problems need to be dealt with with the criminal law. Um, and maybe we could accomplish a rollback through defunding the police, we could also potentially accomplish it through uh, rolling back the reach of the substantive criminal law. And then down at the local level, most law enforcement is actually uh, organized at the local level. Each locality has to decide whether to have a police force or whether it should maybe consolidate its policing with some other nearby towns or up at the county level, uh, as Camden famously did. Um, they have a lot of budgeting decisions to make, which is, again, is a focus of the defund movement. How much do you allocate towards your school system versus your police department? Um, they have responsibility for hiring and firing the individuals who we see out on the streets, um, policing the population. They negotiate collective bargaining agreements with the officers union. And we should be asking ourselves why, uh, I think, frankly, they negotiate such bad ones. Um, what's going on there and how can the cities be doing better? They set use of force policies um, that determine when officers can shoot, when officers can um, engage in a car chase, when they can tase somebody, when they, whether or when they can use a chokehold uh, and anything like this. And they engage in civilian oversight efforts. Um, uh, the, um, various civilian oversight commission models exist around the country. Um, there's a lot of debate about how well they work, but when that's happening, it's usually happening at a local level. And the last thing I'll say, just as the final piece of table setting, um, is that there are also a lot of private actors um, that uh, bring to bear 
uh, their own incentives on the behavior of police officers. So I've written some about the role that insurance companies play in shaping police behavior because most cities in this country buy liability insurance and have a relationship with a liability insurer that advises them about how to police. There are accreditation agencies, which are private bodies that can accredit an agency, get it a discount on its insurance policy and how well or poorly they're doing their jobs may also affect behavior on the ground. And there are various vendors. You see all this um, technology, military equipment, stingrays, surveillance equipment. Um, this is all developed and marketed by private vendors um, and also affects the policing we see on the ground. So I'll, I'll conclude there, my seven minutes are up, but the main point, again, is just that this is an enormously complex area of law, and I'm excited that so many uh, law students and lawyers are interested in learning more about it, because there's a lot of work to do. Thank you. And now, Professor Futterman. The murder of um, Mahmoud Arbery hit me especially hard, I'm just jogging. I can't even begin to put words to the anger that just consumed me. I just couldn't contain it. And at the same time, I couldn't contain my pain. I feel like I'm running out of tears. And I've also found myself profoundly afraid, especially as I think of my two young nephews outside of Atlanta. I mean, just jogging. It's not like I wasn't already viscerally aware of the ongoing reality of racism. When I watched the video of those white men hunt down and murder yet another black man, this time for jogging in a white neighborhood. But that knowledge doesn't make the pain of racism hurt any less. And truthfully, it knocked me off my feet. I couldn't function for days. When I learned that police in Louisville broke into Breonna Taylor's home, shot her repeatedly, killed her based on an unsubstantiated tip of illegal drug sales that involved two people who actually lived more than 10 miles away and were locked up in jail at the time the police raided Ms. Taylor's home. My students and I were actually in the middle of challenging a very similar set of practices in Chicago. Second year student Marie Pleka um, has been leading an effort to organize evidence in support of an enforcement action to remedy the Chicago Police Department's ongoing practice of violently raiding the homes of innocent black and brown families. Raids that startle folk while they're sleeping in the middle of the night, officers busting in like gangbangers, gangbusters really, with guns drawn, pointing assault rifles at little kids and their parents, handcuffing little kids, physically abusing parents in front of their kids, breaking toys, forcing men and women out of their beds in states of address, undress in front of their neighbors. I mean, disrespecting the very humanity and dignity of black and brown families. As with Breonna Taylor in Louisville, all based on information that CPD systematically fails to confirm. I also couldn't sleep after I witnessed George Floyd's murder. Weeks later today, I continue to struggle after seeing the video of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin press his knee on George Floyd's neck with his hand in his pocket protected by his police partners while he stares directly into that camera and a crowd of people without a care in the world for eight minutes, 46 seconds. As Mr. Floyd repeatedly begs for his life, please, sir, I can't breathe. He calls for his mother, and then he's unable to say anything at all. I'm still haunted by that image. As y'all know, tens of thousands of people around the world have taken to the streets in protest. And my mind calls back to powerful protest about four years earlier in Chicago, right here, after our clinic won a court order that forced the police department to release that horrific video of officer Jason Van Dyke firing 16 shots into the body of 17-year-old Laquan McDonald as he lay helpless in the street. Your young black people shut down, we shut down Chicago's magnificent mile on Black Friday, busiest shopping day of the year, shouting 16 shots and a cover-up. The entire world took notice. As much has changed over these past four years, some things feel all too much the same. I mean, just as before, about a thousand people have been killed each year by police in America. And just as before, black folks remain far more than twice as likely as whites to be killed by police. 
I mean, the appalling reality today is that a young black man in America may have a greater chance of dying at the hands of the police than by COVID-19. So, I mean, is it surprising that the protests have escalated from those of just those four years ago? Is it surprising that people are even more angry and frustrated, more pain? I mean, here we stand in the year 2020, and folks still haven't listened. Personally, I, I've been trying to work to channel my own anger, my own pain toward positive action. And one of the things we've been doing in the clinic, as Richard said, we've been busy as heck, um, is documenting Chicago police violence directed at people who are outside protesting police violence, documenting, listening to people's stories, archiving video. I mean, in the past 10 days alone, we've received reports of more than 250 individual instances of CPD violence toward people who've been raising their voices in protests. False arrests, brutal beatings, broken bones, disappearing and holding people incommunicado in police stations. That's what's been happening. At this moment, Right now, some of my colleagues were preparing a mandamus petition to bring an end to these ongoing incommunicado detentions. And we're taking the required steps to enforce to the fullest the federal consent decree over the Chicago Police Department that our clinic won just about a year ago today to remedy the police department's ongoing pattern and practice of discriminatory violence and more. I'm still not getting very much sleep. But two things. Two things have given me real hope in this moment that I wanted to highlight before I stop for a moment. First, through my own pain, um, I see real beauty and hope in the hundreds of thousands of people around the world who continue to lift their voices together to affirm that Black Lives Matter. I'm talking, we're talking about people of all races, genders, ages, social statuses, protesting police violence, demanding change. I really see that hope, that beauty, the creative energy and spirit in each of you. And I'm proud of, so proud of the hundreds of UPC law students who've worked with me over the past two decades to use our legal power, to use our privilege, to support the work of people on the ground fighting for that change, challenging racism. And strangely, I found a second reason for hope in the midst of this painful and deadly pandemic. One of the things this pandemic has done is to make us all stop, to stop so many of the things we've taken for granted, how we do things, how we organize our lives, everything is just grinded to a halt. The basic law of momentum dictates that we got to stop before we're able to change directions. And this four stop provides each of us with an opportunity. And that's the opportunity to question all we've done, to ask whether it makes sense, to continue doing it, just to do things better. We stand at a safe social distance, not just in the midst of the COVID pandemic, but we also find ourselves in a parallel moment, brutally awake to yet another reminder that, you know what, no matter how many times we shout and continue to shout that Black Lives Matter, millions of people in our society remain incapable of seeing Black people as fully human, and many of them still police officers. Racism persists. We have to stop before we can change directions. Thank you so much. Um, Professor uh, Sharon Fairley. Thank you, um, Dean McAdams. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining on the, the webinar today. It's, although we can't necessarily see your faces, it's just, it's heartwarming to see that there are this many of us in the Chicago community who are concerned and, and really want to understand what's going on. I think the frustration that is certainly palpable in the remarks of Professor Futterman are well understood because the question that I keep hearing people ask is, why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? And when I look at the systems that are meant to deliver police reform and the systems for accountability, there are two areas that I see um, that I'd like to talk about today. The first is just the basic law of use of force. And then the other 
is the, the systems that we have in place, the accountability systems that we have in place, which include civilian oversight. So as Professor Rappaport so eloquently discussed, the use of for, the law governing the use of force is, is a sort of patchwork of legal rules that come from federal law, state law, and then of course the department policies. So let's just start talking first with the federal law. The constitutional standard, which comes from courts interpreting the Fourth Amendment and its protection against unreasonable seizure, and uh, by the law, uh, ex excessive force is, is seen as, a, as an unreasonable seizure. It's a very low standard. It allows, for example, an officer to use deadly force against a person who is fleeing merely because that person um, uh, has committed a violent offense somewhere even though that person doesn't represent an imminent threat to that officer in that moment. And so this, the law around the, the use of force, the federal law, is very, very slow to develop. There's a lot of reasons for that. These inquiries are very fact specific. So sometimes when cases are decided, you don't get a broad principle coming out of it that can be then used to decide in the future to, to, to decide other cases. There's also the doctrine of qualified immunity, which kind of slows the development of the law. And then also there's a real endogeneity problem in the law uh, of the use of force. And that's because police officers are really involved in the establishment of the law. They testify in court as experts. And then they also uh, very frequently submit amicus briefs supporting officers when uh, cases go up the chain of courts and, uh, on appeal. And so this, this, this constitutional standard is very low. So that leaves state law as a source of, of to cabin officers' conduct. And state laws, uh, there are about 42 of the 50 states have laws on the books that govern an officer's use of force. Unfortunately, many of those kind of track just the constitutional standard rather than raising the bar and creating higher levels of limits for officers' use of force. We are seeing some progress there. Last year, the state of California really tightened their law up and made a much stronger, much more robust state statute that governs force and introduced the concepts of de-escalation, for example, and necessity. And, and so these, this is a trend that I hope will continue. Um, and then, of course, you have department policies, and they govern an officer's behavior on the street, and they're the, the rules that are used to decide when an officer can be punished. I won't talk a lot about that because I think Professor Flores is going to go into that area pretty well. Um, so there's a lot that needs to happen to really strengthen and make more cohesive the use of force law. The second area is the accountability systems and civilian oversight. So civilian oversight has been around for a long time and it's become increasingly prevalent where you have civilian entities that are responsible for um, investigating police misconduct, reviewing police misconduct investigations, conducting audits and adjudicating police misconduct cases. But, um, and so we have that the, these are very prevalent at this point. There's about 61 out of the top 100 US cities has some form of civilian oversight. Um, but the problem we face is many of these entities really don't have or not imbued with the power to actually make change happen. And so that's why you see in a place like Minneapolis, Minneapolis did, does have a, an oversight agency. They have an agency that investigates misconduct. So the question I keep hearing is why, you know, when we have these robust civilian oversight systems, why do we seem to be so slow in terms of making progress in police reform? And a lot of times it's because these entities just don't have the power to make decisions. They can make recommendations, but they can't necessarily implement them. And then, of course, there are other sort of cracks in the uh, process towards accountability where officers can slip through the cracks and not be held accountable. And some of these come from other sources, such as collective bar bargaining agreements, where they have provisions that uh, impact the ability to hold officers accountable. And some are procedural mechanisms that allow things to go off the rails. So there's a lot that can be done to shore up these systems and make them more sustainably effective. Because what we want to do is break out of this scandal reform repeat cycle. We've seen that here in Chicago. We have a scandal, we initiate some reforms, and then everything's fine until the next scandal happens. So what we need to do is start to create a more sustainably effective accountability structure for, for police oversight. And so with that, I will turn it back to Professor McAdams. Thank you. Um, all right, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Flores. <clears throat> 
Thank you, uh, Deputy Dean McAdams. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I thought I would use my seven minutes to um, try to put some of this conversation in a little bit of an international and global context. Um, as many of my colleagues have said, you know, this is a really difficult time, but I think um, a lot of people also see it as a, as a hopeful time, uh, a moment when we can really uh, rethink uh, the role of police in our society and uh, the responsibilities that we've allocated to the police. Um, we all need to remember that this is a government service, right? Just like teachers and streets and sanitation uh, and the police departments in various states have developed in a particular way, uh, but it doesn't need to be that way and we can rethink uh, where it's appropriate to have the police and what are the appropriate strategies that the police should be doing in protecting the citizenry. Um, so obviously this is not just a challenge that faces the United States. Uh, the role of police power is one of the most important issues in every society. Uh, how governments engage with the police, how governments use the police, uh, and, uh, and, and what, what limits the police have on uh, their form of operation. Uh, and the international human rights system has a lot to say about that. Um, and, and debates about police power have been ongoing for years. Uh, obviously, the issue of police lethal use of force invokes the most fundamental uh, international human rights, um, some of which we refer to as civil rights in this country, uh, but the right to life, liberty and security, uh, torture, cruel and inhuman treatment, uh, freedom of expression and association in the context of protest, and then of course the ability to enjoy these rights in uh, a non-discriminatory manner, which is really a lot of the conversation that we've been having uh, here in this country. Uh, and above all else, the value that we place on human life. Life. And that's where we find some disturbing trends uh, in the police department policies that, as Deputy Dean McAdams mentioned, the clinic uh, spent the last few years looking at. Um, in the international human rights system, what has developed to protect these rights that I just mentioned uh, is a list of basically four principles. Uh, and uh, the principles are legality, necessity, proportionality, and accountability. And you find some of these principles within the US system, uh, but as Professor Fairley mentioned, you know, a lot of the meat of what actually cabins police discretion is in police department policies. Some of it is at the state legislative level, uh, but really what tells police officers what to do is in the departmental policies and they really vary because of the way that our law is structured. So what these international human rights principles uh, sort of require is that police only use force when it's necessary. And that means that uh, only in response to an imminent and particularized threat and only as a last resort. Uh, it also requires that police use force that is proportional. So if they're being faced with a deadly, a deadly threat, then they can use deadly force in response, um, but that that threat must be a threat to life or serious bodily harm to the officer or another person. And those are obviously directed towards cabining the police's action in the moment that they're deciding whether or not to use deadly force. Uh, and then there are the systems of accountability and legality so that the force is grounded in law and that also there are robust uh, mechanisms of accountability that include independent and external reporting. And as Professor Fairley mentioned, a lot of those, even though they're present in some way in police department policies, they're not really robust because even some of the external mechanisms don't actually have the power to hold police accountable. So what we did is we analyzed the police department policies, the 2018 policies, because uh, they actually, a lot of them needed to be FOIA'd actually. Um, one of the issues in this country is a lack of transparency with what the policies are. Uh, and what we found is that every, uh, every policy in the 20 largest states or cities in the United States by population failed these standards that I just described to you in one way or another. Uh, so all of them actually failed the legality requirement because none of the states had human rights compliant laws that the police uh, department policies were grounded in. Um, eight of them failed the necessity prong, uh, uh, having various exceptions for fleeing felons uh, or uh, preventing the commission of a felony. Uh, Houston's policy, for example, allowed uh, police officers to use force so long as they constantly assessed the situation and adjusted use of force as necessary. So you can imagine that language uh, doesn't really cabin the discretion of a police officer uh, that is interested in using lethal force. Uh, three of them failed the proportionality prong, uh, permitting lethal force, for example, for general self-defense without requiring 
uh, requiring that the police officers uh, actually have a threat to their life and not just self-defense. And then 18 of the cities failed the accountability prong uh, because of what we've already discussed, you know, a failure to have real, robust, independent, external reporting mechanisms that demanded accountability. So essentially, our largest cities failed to meet these basic standards. Uh, and what is important about this is that because we're not the only country facing these problems, as we're rethinking how we want to rethink the police, we can look to our neighbors and we can look to international standards. Uh, and, and one of the things that those of us who work in the international space hope is that we will start to look at how other countries have dealt with these same problems. Uh, and there are many different models for this. In Finland and Norway, officers have to seek permission before they, sh they shoot anyone. Uh, in Spain, officers are required to issue verbal calls cautions and warning shots. Uh, Chokeholds are actually outlawed in many European countries. Um, Europe is a good example because every police department in the European Union actually operates under the EU's human rights standard. Uh, and so that ends up changing the way that the police interact with the community and how the police think of their uh, relationship with the service that they provide. You see that a lot in the context of protests, for example. You know, the way that the US police talk about protests and the way that a lot of European police talk about protests is very stark in contrast. A lot of European police uh, forces think of themselves as facilitating the right to protest, as being there to ensure that protest happens and not just tolerating it in the way that we do uh, and the way that some of our police departments uh, do in our country. So I think that I'll stop there um, because I know Professor Huck is going to talk about what defund the police uh, movements are actually asking for. Um, but I think that in thinking about how police departments can be restructured, uh, we can really think about these failures and what other models might look like and where the police simply are not the appropriate civil service uh, to be assisting society in meeting its various goals. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Huck. Thank you very much, Deputy Dean Adams. Um, I think it's uh, important to preface uh, my remarks uh, uh, with two uh, uh, comments uh, to begin with. First, in the space of two weeks, the Black Lives Matter movement has done more to change the conversation on policing and racial violence by police in the United States. Uh, it's done more than uh, what than, than, uh, academics have done in the last uh, decade or two decades. Moreover, a central point of the Black Lives Matter movement, as I understand it, is that many of the pinpoint reforms that scholars like myself have uh, advocated are either inefficacious or counterproductive. I think it's very important for me uh, in my uh, capacity as a scholar commenting on the Black Lives Matter movement to begin with that uh, observation and to say that uh, I, I take the critique that's embedded in the observation very seriously uh, as something that I need to think hard about. Uh, my second prefatory comment uh, goes to the substance of my remarks. Uh, I intended to make comments on one of the central uh, demands of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, that of defunding the police, and I, I will do so. Uh, my aim is to place that uh, demand in its historical context and to explain how it might be understood as a, a profound critique of the way that social policy has developed, particularly in the United States, over the 20th and 21st century. Um, as I was preparing my remarks, uh, I learned that a, uh, another scholar at the University of Chicago uh, in the economics department uh, had compared the defund the police position to uh, what he called uh, flat earthism. Uh, I, I think it's reasonable to say that this uh, evinces a certain refusal uh, even to attempt to understand uh, a policy position. Um, I, I don't know the professor, but I, I think it's also reasonable to, to say that uh, making an assertion of that kind uh, risks at least uh, conveying the impression to uh, minority colleagues and students that their uh, perspectives are not um, valuable. Uh, 
Um, and the, the, the comment, uh, I, I think, is, is in that regard consistent neither with uh, the free speech nor the pedagogical values that uh, I hope the University of Chicago stands for. Uh, and I hope also that my uh, comments now uh, go some way toward uh, uh, explaining and, and, and offering a, a positive account uh, rather than dismissal of uh, uh, this uh, BLM proposal. Okay, on to substance. Black Lives Matter is not uh, the first uh, nationwide movement that has led uh, to the defunding of the police in the 21st century. Uh, but by comparing Black Lives Matter's demands to its immediate precursor, I think we learned something uh, important about uh, the nature of defund the police as a demand today. Between 2007 and 2013, some 28 uh, urban uh, municipalities either declared bankruptcy or entered state receivership. Cut costs to divert revenues to uh, debt payments, these cities generally undertook severe and dramatic austerity measures. In many instances, this included dramatic uh, reductions or eliminations of the police. In the California city of San Bernardino, for example, 250 officers were fired. The city attorney told residents at a town meeting, lock your doors and load your guns. Between 2006 and 2012, the Californian city of Vallejo shrunk its police force from 155 to 93. Between 2009 and 2012, Stockton eliminated about a quarter of its police officers. In Newark, Mayor Cory Booker sold the city's historic headquarters. In January 2011, the city of Camden, two years before it dissolved its police department, cut its police force in half and eliminated its homicide and narcotics division. Defund the police, therefore, was not earlier in this century a progressive idea. It was a central element in an austerity agenda. Um, it is worth noting that the same University of Chicago economics professor who decries defund the police today, in 2005, uh, mounted a spirited argument in favor of austerity in European countries, arguing that many, such as Greece, quote, have a lot of surplus employment in the government sector. One of the areas in which the Greek government cut uh, resources or, or cut state capacity as part of austerity programs was, of course, the police. Um, so how is today's demand for defunding of the police different from what's gone before? Uh, if we look to the words of uh, BLM itself, and I'm going to quote Alicia Garza, uh, who's one of the co-founders, um, today's demand differs in that it does not call for the elimination of funding. Rather, it calls for the movement of funding toward housing, toward increased funding for education, and increased funding for quality of life of communities that are over-policed and over -surveilled. That is, uh, the BLM demand for defunding the police is about shifting resources from the coercive arm of the state to what uh, Piketty calls the social state. In this regard, it is useful to understand BLM as a repudiation of a style of government that uh, is generally known as neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, as it's been defined and glossed by scholars such as Quinn Slobogan, is not about eliminating or, or reducing absolutely the function of the state. It's about, uh, again, in Slobogan's words, encasing the state's caring and redistributive capacities while engorging its coercive capacities, some, sometimes euphemistically called the night watchman state. So what BLM is calling for when it calls for um, defunding of the police is a reversal of the pattern of fiscal f flows that have characterized urban policy making, making since the 1968 Street, Safe Streets Act. That statute created the Law Enforcement Assistant Administration, the LEAA, which has funneled over time some 225 billion in current dollars 
taken to police in cities with predominantly African-American communities into the jails and into the prisons that house them. At the same time, uh, federal funding has, uh, has dramatically decreased with respect to the social state. So if the catchphrase or the demand defund the police triggers conditions from uh, uh, other parts of, the institu of this institution, I do not think it is because of its novelty or implausibility. It is rather because of the profound and sophisticated challenge that it tenders to the cruelties of uh, the hegemonic form of policymaking in the United States today. Uh, thank you, Professor Hawk. Um, so we will uh, now uh, move on to the Q&A uh, portion of the event, uh, but I will begin by introducing an additional five faculty who will, with the speakers, um, uh, help respond to the questions. We have uh, a number that have been posed in the Q&A function, and I, I, I urge others to uh, add their questions. So let me introduce the additional five people you've, you've been seeing since the beginning. Uh, Professor Hershella Conyers joined the law school in 1993, is the director of the Mandel Criminal and Juvenile Justice Clinic, and has been, had many experiences with police in her representation of juvenile defendants. Uh, Professor Mary Ann Case joined the law school in 1999. Her teaching and scholarship focuses, focuses on issues of gender, sex, and family. Professor Case has written about gender issues uh, in policing. Professor Jonathan Maser joined the law school in 2005. He teaches and writes on criminal law and policing and is a former chair of the university's independent review committee, which has some uh, oversight or responsibility for the university's police force. Professor Allison Siegler joined the law school in 2008. She is the director of our Federal Criminal Justice Clinic, which represents indigent defendants charged with federal felonies. And she has you know, written about uh, issues of race that come up in those representations. And Professor Sonia Starr will join the law school, I'm happy to say, on July the 1st. Uh, she is uh, not currently, uh, she's currently at uh, another law school. Um, the University of Michigan. Uh, she teaches and writes on criminal law and particularly on issues of race. Um, so we have a number of questions, but I, I would like to, uh, I'm not gonna necessarily take these in order. There's, there's one uh, question that um, if I can find it, uh, perhaps I'll simply uh, summarize it. Um, but I think I think it uh, it's it's good to get to it now because I know Professor Huck may have to leave us, and I I would like to sort of direct this to Professor Siegler, uh, as well as Professor Huck. We have this question about what is what is the role of the federal government in all of this? What can the what can the federal government do, if anything? Um, uh, and I think the the particular question asked about you know what. President Trump could do by executive order, uh, which, you know, maybe he's planning to do something. Um, and so uh, I think this, this is a fairly big question that uh, uh, talks both about the, the, the uh, federal criminal law and federal enforcement and also about uh, the president. So um, let, me, let me ask uh, Professor Siegler first to comment. Sure, um, I can start on this and then maybe somebody else can take up the specific question of what a president can do with an executive order. But as far as at the federal level, um, you know, as some of the speakers have already mentioned, um, Senator Booker and Senator Harris and others have introduced this Justice and Policing Act of 2020, which, um, you know, the Republicans are resisting. Uh, but one of the most important components of that act is that it would, it would eliminate qualified immunity for the police, which is, um, you know, one of the things that's been discussed here is something that would enable people to recover damages um, when, when the cops violate their constitutional rights. Um, you know, again, this is something the Republicans are strongly resisting. Our Senator, Senator Durbin, is not going to 
um, sign any bill that doesn't have that provision in it. So he's saying that's an essential piece of this, of any law. But fundamentally, it is a tough question of like, what can the feds do about the fact that a lot of this is at a state and local level? And the main thing they can do is they have, you know, the purse strings, right? And so um, there are various parts of this act that are about banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants federally, but then also having funding incentives um, for state police and local police to implement similar reforms. So there's a lot of reforms that look like that. It's like, we're going to fix it federally, and then, you know, we provide these financial incentives um, um, for, the, for the states and local entities to do that. Um, you know, I think I, one of the things is also body cams, which I just need to say, like, I think that is so essential here. I mean, I, for anyone who's read the, pol the, the police report that came out of the murder of George Floyd, it's completely devoid of anything that Chauvin actually did. You know, it, it doesn't talk about, um, it, if you read this police report, you have no idea what happened. You need that body cam footage to understand that it's a completely different circumstance. The, 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 the report says literally nothing about, about the murder, about the kneeling on the neck. Um, it's a horrific, horrific sort of disconnect there. Um, and it just shows the, the, the essential nature of body cam footage. So uh, I'll let somebody else take on this question of sort of executive orders. Uh, perhaps, Professor Hawk, you could comment on that. Our system of federalism uh, gives uh, the maintenance of public safety largely to the states as opposed to the federal government. Uh, most policing and most uh, incarceration, therefore, is performed by the states or localities, not by the federal government. That doesn't mean that the federal government lacks uh, instruments uh, uh, to influence the path of policing. Uh, funding is probably the most important of them. Uh, also important is substantive rules that might, for example, uh, criminalize certain kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, police tactics uh, and uh, substantive rules that might uh, prohibit certain kinds of disparate, uh, racially disparate policing. Um, with respect to the president's authority under an executive order, uh, this will, as a matter of formal law, depend upon what his uh, statutory authorities are, since uh, Article 2 constitutional authorities don't go to or, or don't run to uh, matters of local policing. Um, here, uh, there uh, may be opportunities with respect to uh, funding uh, that uh, remains in uh, the, uh, the, fed, the president's discretionary uh, uh, control. Um, and there are also opportunities, although I doubt that they will be taken up, uh, with respect to directing the Justice Department to uh, take up some of the reform litigation that had been underway toward the end of the, just of the Obama administration and that was preemptorily uh, terminated by uh, Attorney General Sessions in 2017. Uh, I, I would not expect that to happen, but that would be a potentially efficacious uh, intervention uh, uh, by the president. Thank you. So there is a question, uh, at least one direct question um, uh, um, from the attendees about race and the role of race in the criminal justice system. I feel like um, almost uh, everyone I, uh, on the, on the, we have today could, could speak to this issue. But let me get two people who haven't yet uh, spoken involved. Um, and that would be uh, Professor Conyers and Professor Starr. Um, you know, I, I'll just mention like, uh, as, as the question did, there was a Wall Street Journal edit, editor op-ed a few uh, days ago, I, I think it was by Heather McDonald, uh, which which uh, uh, questioned, you know, whether the um, uh, police uh, are actually uh, uh, acting in a disproportionate way uh, uh, in the use of force. And uh, so, uh, you know, others may want to comment as well. But let me let me just start with uh, professors uh, Conyers and Starr. I'll start. Um, you know, race in the criminal justice system. I'm not quite sure 
uh, that's all been done, that's all been documented. Okay, uh, communities of color are over-policed everywhere, it seems to me, uh, and everything that I have seen on that. Uh, and when I say over-policed, I mean several things. One, the presence of what uh, someone has talked about as the aggressive uh, enforcement as opposed to what used to be called, you know, uh, neighborhood policing. Two, uh, and this implicates the uh, justice system as well as the police departments, uh, the charging and overcharging of offenses that, uh, that leads to serious felony convictions uh, for minorities uh, without regard to the impact of a felony conviction on housing, education, uh, work opportunities for years to come. Uh, it is a system that is, as I have seen it in Cook County, and as I have talked with other colleagues all over this country, that has a perception of dangerousness around Black people, and that includes Black women. Uh, and it includes, as we see with the death of George Floyd, uh, it includes older uh, African American and brown citizens. Uh, so it is, it is part of our system. It is what our system is. Uh, it flows out of a racist uh, notion about people of color. Uh, and we started it, we didn't start it, but one of the highlights of it was when we began to euphemistically talk about the war on drugs and the war on crime. Uh, and nobody stopped to ask who are the soldiers and who will be uh, the casualties. I could go on forever, but I'd like to hear uh, Professor Starr's comments on this and maybe we can get back to a further discussion. Um, thanks, Professor Conyers, and thank thank you um, for the the question. Um, so. Um, I uh, so I haven't read that particular uh, Heather McDonald piece in the the Wall Street Journal. I'm, I'm not currently paying to get behind the Wall Street Journal's paywall, but the um, but uh, the um, you know Heather McDonald has been beating this drum for a long time, and she has a big audience on the um, uh, on the right um, and. Uh, the basic move that she makes is to say, oh, like, as long as you choose the right denominator, right, as long as you compare the distribution of police violence or, or um, arrests or, or other policing outcomes to what she considers to be a measure of the distribution of crime, um, then uh, no longer do do police look racist. Um, I could say a few things about that. Um, there's, uh, you know, complicated statistical arguments you could make in response um, uh, in response to that. Um, I'm not going to bother with those. Um, uh, one thing to say is that um, the thing that she likes to compare to is itself, it's, it's a sort of circular argument because she likes to compare things to the distribution of, uh, of uh, of arrests in the community, right? And so that that's circular because it's essentially comparing police conduct to police conduct. Like, no kidding, um, I, I, black people are more likely to be arrested. That's part of the problem. That's um, that's uh, being critiqued, right? Um, um, and then um, another thing to say, I think, is that um, one way to think about. Uh, problems of racial disparity in our, um, in our system, which you might think of as a, a disparate impact approach, or you might think of as um, a different way to think about what kind of racial discrimination is taking place, is to ask yourself, would our society tolerate the continuation of the, of the current state of affairs if it were white people being treated the way that black people are currently being treated, right? So, so I think about that. I, I work a lot on mass incarceration issues. Um, and, and so that's a thought experiment um, that I, I feel like has a really obvious answer that, that like, would we tolerate our, our astronomical rate of, um, 
of uh, incarcerating our own citizens. Um, if it were one out of nine white men under 35 who were behind bars at any given time, or one out of three white men um, who would pass through um, jail or prison at some time in their life. Um, I think the answer is, surely and obviously no, right? Um, and the same is true in policing, right? Like regardless of what um, kind of statistical tricks you can try to pull to make it seem like there, there is no, uh, you know, real racism on the part of police, the fact is that um, we have uh, a police force that commits way more violence than um, than any other police force in the world, or, or a collect set of police forces, obviously. Like the, um, um, we have we have way more uses of force. We have just a, a much more active police presence than in other democratic countries, um, and um, and uh, it is. Uh, uh, black and brown communities that are bearing the brunt um, of uh, of that, uh, and I don't think we would be continuing to live in in um, with that consequence uh, were it not for who who it is who is um, uh, who who is uh, bearing the um, the brunt. And so um, I think it's uh, one thing um, to notice about the demands being made. Um, by uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's framed as defunding the police, uh, the, the stronger demand um, uh, abolish the police, like, um, um, and, or all these other demands about reforming the police, reinventing, et cetera, however they're framed. Um, none of them are just saying, let's equalize the rates of violence um, bet um, committed against black and white people, right? Like, that's not the fundamental thing being addressed. The fundamental thing is that the police are out of control, right? Um, and um, and uh, if we, um, you know, yes, it has a racially disparate impact and that is, um, and there's racism associated with it, but the demand isn't just for leveling that out in some way, right? The demand is to fundamentally refocus um, uh, what, uh, what police are doing in a, in a m to make their mission much narrower, to make them not the first person people that we call when um, there's say a, a mental health or an addiction um, uh, concern. Um, the, the current moment is, is calling for us to rethink the police um, in really substantial ways. And uh, racism and racially disparate impact are, are part of what uh, are, 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 you know, obviously huge key dimensions of the problem. Um, but the solutions that are being called for are not limited to, to addressing that. Um, thank you. Let me move to a question that it, I think we had at least two people asked. And I want to, um, uh, this has to be posed to Sharon Fairley in part, but let me also ask, um, uh, perhaps Jonathan Mazur to think about uh, the question um, of, of, of what the right structure for police accountability uh, could be um, or what the obstacles are. So the particular question, um, which is, is, is about uh, Citizens Police Accountability Councils, which is a, uh, you know, the acronym CPAC, uh, you know, it also refers to a conservative political action committee. So I, I was, I have to confess being confused at first. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, um, an idea that is associated with some kinds of civilian account uh, um, control of the police. And I, I wanted to ask Sharon, like, how does this differ from what Chicago has or other cities have? Chicago has now this organization, COPA, that you uh, helped to create and, and run for a while. And so, uh, so, so what is the right way to do uh, citizen um, control of the police? Right, so when we look at civilian oversight of police, there's like no 
one way, one right way to do it. Basically, every city sort of cobbles together a system that they think is going to work best in that particular jurisdiction. What we do see happening, though, in the last few years is that cities are building multi-tiered systems. So rather than just having one agency that does one kind of oversight, such as having a civilian re review board, they have put together multiple entities. So one group investigates, another group reviews, another group does another piece. And by surrounding the problem from all sides, they try to create a system that is in its entirety more robust. So here in Chicago, we have a multi-tiered system. We have the Civilian Office of Police Accountability that investigates. We have the audit function by the Public Safety Inspector General. And then we have the Civilian Police Board that adjudicates misconduct. So the, the, the ordinance that's the idea that's being bandied about right now is, is to put another civilian board that's kind of overlaid on top of that entire structure and the department to sort of govern and make sure that the accountability system is working the way it should. One of the big questions, though, is exactly how much power that entity will be afforded. For example, will that entity have the power to dictate policing policy, right? Uh, so will the community actually be given the power to say uh, how we're going to police the neighborhoods that, 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 that they're in? Um, and so this is, this is a big question because, again, that power has to be taken from somewhere, which is going to be from police leadership and the mayor. Um, and then, of course, you have these other entities that, by ordinance, already have certain policy recommendation power. So the other big question to be answered is, how do you resolve conflicts when you have this overseeing entity that believes that you know, has a policy that they want to implement, the department disagrees, or even some of these other oversight entities may disagree. How do you resolve those conflicts? So that, that's a question that I have about how this whole thing is going to work. And then the second, the second uh, comment that I'll make is because the bottom layer, like COPA, the police board, because that there are still uh, structural impediments to accountability that exist within that layer, just putting this other layer on top may not solve all the problems that we have. As long as there are, for example, collective bargaining agreement provisions that prevent anonymous complaints from being investigated, that prevent officers from being interviewed um, after, immediately after an officer involved shooting. Um, if, as long as there are these other structural impediments to accountability in the, in the rest of the system, just putting this other layer on top may not solve everything. So, um, I, I agree uh, completely with what everything that Professor Fairley had to say, and and I would add I think that as a sort of general matter, the 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 goal should be to move as many of these sorts of systems of accountability as far away from the hierarchy of the police department as possible. So departments you know, started in the, on that trend themselves years ago when they created internal affairs divisions that would engage in investigation of officers who were accused of misconduct. And the goal was to have those internal affairs divisions sort of outside of the standard police hierarchy, but they were often still reporting to, um, to the police, uh, chief of police or the police superintendent the sorts of civilian re review mechanisms that Professor Fairley is describing are another step in the right direction there in that they take the investigatory and the adjudicatory function even further outside of the police force and put them in the hands of bodies that are not beholden to police in the same way. I, I guess I would add that I, I think that another key important piece of this is um, this thinking about the same sorts of structures on the side of public prosecutors as well. So. Um, Obviously, being able to fire or discipline police officers as a sort of employment matter is important, but being able to threaten officers who really do engage in violence or who help cover up violence by others uh, with criminal prosecution seems like uh, an extremely important tool here as well, especially when that um, sort of the level of misconduct rises, uh, you know, to these sort of intolerable levels. And so part of the problem is that um, Prosecutors, even though they are outside of the police force, they're beholden to police in many ways. They rely upon the police to testify as witnesses in their cases, to bring them casework and evidence. Um, 
you know, to help them sort of perform their basic job functions. And so in a lot of cities, prosecutors are very reluctant to run afoul of the police because they are so dependent on the police. Now, there are some cities that have elected these so-called sort of progressive prosecutors who are doing a better job of that in many ways, but the structural problem still exists. And so separate offices within sort of prosecutorial regimes that involve separate prosecutors who are charged with bringing police misconduct cases and who themselves are not in any way reliant on the police for making cases of other types are the same type of sort of structural separation mechanism that we see you know, in, in organizations like COPA and that can really help in these types of regards. And so I, I think that we need to think a little bit more about how, and, and, and cities should be more creative in trying to structure prosecutorial offices in way, ways that make those prosecutors better able to bring um, misconduct cases through the criminal system and not just through the sort of the employment systems. Thank you. Um, we have a question that is a is about uh, you know what 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 is necessary for for real change, um, and noted the failure of some new police training in Minneapolis to prevent uh, you know uh, the murder of George Floyd, and uh, that's that's a tough question. Obviously, again, something all panelists could perhaps speak to, but I want to, I want to talk to, I want to ask Marianne Case to say something and I'll, 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 I'll put my own spin on this question. Uh, and also uh, Craig Futterman, who has, who has been, you know, litigating police issues for a long time and has a sense of the different cultures within the police department and, and maybe how they're at war with one another to some degree. Um, so, and Marianne has written, I know, about gender and policing and, um, and I think uh, about uh, toxic masculinity in different contexts. Um, so what, what, can you, what, can you say, uh, what can you say about diagnosing uh, the, the issues of police culture and how they contribute to uh, the use of violence? So I have to say, I have been uh, writing and thinking about this for 30 years, and what depresses me is how little has changed. Uh, I started writing and thinking about this at the time the Christopher Commission looked into the beating of Rodney King. And the problems diagnosed were the same, and I would say that the solutions then proposed would have been useful then, would have been useful at the time of Ferguson, are still useful today. Uh, Richard has described me as working on gender and policing. What I mean in this context by gender is qualities coded masculine or feminine, sometimes uh, irrespective, sometimes inflected by whether the person exhibiting them is male or female. And what the Christopher Commission said then now, which I would like to second, is that the problem is that the job of policing has been conceptualized straight down the line as not only a male, but a masculine job. Um, this is a, uh, Rochelle Conyers talked about conceptualizing this as war, Donald Trump conceptualizing this as dominating. Uh, when we talk about federal funding, it's been military equipment that has been sent to the police. What the Christopher Commission said uh, with respect to the beating of Rodney King is we should be thinking about the job of the police in what I as a feminist theorist would call a more feminine rather than a more masculine way. So instead of recruiting people from the military, we should be recruiting social workers. Instead of uh, valuing aggressiveness and assertiveness and domination, we should value communication skills. This gets back to the notion of community policing being effective, which several speakers ha have already mentioned. Um, and this might lead to more women in the police, but more importantly, it will lead to uh, more valuing of qualities associated with women and for that reason very often devalued by everyone in the society from the police officers to the current president. Professor Futterman. Thanks Richard. Um, my internet's become a little unstable so if I go off on you, sorry. Um, first, there's, there's no one single magical elixir 
Um, let's just start there. There's no one end all be all. But I think that when we're thinking about solutions, it, you, we have to think of first get our diagnosis right. And the core issues when we're talking about the what what we've been seeing this entire conversation, it begins with one, racism, two, denial, conditions of impunity and not equal conditions of impunity, but back to racism, the social status of victim, neighborhood, subject matters and matters dramatically. And third, secrecy. Um, those are the core, um, the, the, the core problems. And so while I, I don't want to, while I can go on, as Professor Conyers said, I, we can talk for eight hours about this and I still wouldn't cover. Let me just at, at the highest level try to hit. I, I think first the most important thing and, and this may perhaps it relates to the, the calls to defund, reimagine, etc. is let's just start with quit. And I, and, I'm, and I couldn't be more deadly serious. This goes to what Professor Starr was saying too. Um, we need to just stop, stop it, stop arresting, brutalizing, searching, stopping, incarcerating so many black, brown, and poor people. Just quit. Um, one of the things again that, you know, when I talked about the pandemic and this forced stop that um, actually created for an opportunity and partially created an opportunity for an experiment in the United States, just as Professor Flores was talking about um, as compared to other democratic countries, because we certainly are by far the world's greatest incarcerator, um, by far. And um, ask, are we safer? Um, and so number one, just simply with respect to policing, ending so many and discouraging so many, stopping so many unnecessary negative encounters between police and community members, particularly black and brown community members. Um, and you can talk about a number of ways in which that happens, but then just second, just big level, um, if, if we're talking about secrecy, um, the answer is some truth telling. Um, some truth telling and, trans and transparency and that entails, and one of the things that we've been successful or partially successful here in Chicago is redistributing, taking some information that's been exclusively within the control of the state and giving it to the public. And that empowers everyone from academics, researchers, people in prison, ordinary people to do what we're supposed to do in a democratic society, have the information we need to have the kind of informed conversations we need to actually um, inform, our inform our policies and address the lack of police accountability. Just as Professor Ziegler talked about, um, um, I think she mentioned, yes, yeah, she mentioned cameras and body cams, which I definitely don't think are the end all and be all, but part of what cameras and videos being a game changer, and, and we, we, we saw that again just when I was speaking of Ahmaud Arbery earlier, um, when did the action happen? Not when Ahmad Marbury, Arbery was murdered, but when after the release of the video publicly that created the public demand and how things actually change and how have things changed. And when things have changed with respect to policing, with respect to racial progress, it's been when people have stood up, stand up, stood up and demanded that change um, and forced um, departments and governments to change because the reality is and what we've learned in terms of the entrenched nature of these issues is that the departments are around the United States, 18,000 or so of them are incapable of simply doing this themselves. And I, I guess the last bit I'll just say um, um, and or, or two final, I'll try to keep it brief, comments are accountability. I mean it's just first the obvious hold officers accountable um, when they abuse their powers to hurt people. Um, two things about that one I'm a strong proponent for, um, and this goes to things like CPAC as a part of the solution is um, meaningful community power and um, oversight of 
police departments and their different models and glad to talk about the weeds. Um, but the other thing, the other two things about accountability is that what we've seen in departments around the United States, and while lots of folks talk about a few bad apples, I think the issue is the trees and that, yes, we need to pull out root and branch and we think and reimagine, but part of it is that um, we see that still a relatively small minority percentage of officers in any department and groups that will stand out and jump out off the page. Any scandal that you've seen around the nation, there have been years in which complaints, complaints have went unaddressed, impunity, and then, then, the, scan and then the scandal. And so the obvious thing, and this is just low hanging fruit, is to look at and address patterns, not just in a handholding way, but do what we do and do what police departments are supposed to be good at, and that's investigate. If you see a pattern of potentially abusive conduct, you investigate it, and then you get rid of racist and abusive officers. And that's the last bit I guess I wanna say is just about racism too, is that, um, as I said in my opening comments, um, both which much, mo what's most dispiriting and also most least surprising is the reality that we all know that racism persists. But yet all of our policy, and this isn't just about policing, um, the policies that we tend to, that we enact, um, our judicial decisions, et cetera, are all premised on the notion of racism doesn't exist and a blindness. And if we're going to consciously address the reality of racism, that includes the reality of racism and policing, we need to look at, and when we're enacting any practice, any policy, with the backdrop of the knowledge that we all should have by now, the reality of the existence of racism, and then be asking as we're developing these policies and practices, how is the reality of racism going to impact this? And what do we need to do about it? Thank you. So we, uh, everyone has spoken at least once. Um, maybe we've reached a, a more lightning round with having 11 minutes left. So I think I'm going to start asking questions to a single person and if somebody else really you know wants to address that question then then they should um the, the as a segue to uh, what professor futterman just said i i have to say i read in the tribune recently that the newly elected uh speak you know speaking of a, a, a small number of police officers uh sometimes uh co committing a large number of the things about which citizens complain uh excessive use of force uh, I read that the newly elected head of the uh, Chicago Police Union um, had over 50 complaints, which was more than 96% of the police force. And I read something uh, somewhat similar in the Minneapolis paper about the, uh, uh, the head of the union there. And we have a number of specific questions in the Q&A function that are about, what about the role of unions? What about the role of collecting bargaining agreements? So um, I thought I would ask Professor Rappaport, uh, who uh, knows a lot about this, um, uh, and he and I actually have a, a paper together with uh, Professor Dhammika Dharmapala, also on the faculty, but I thought I would just ask more generally, you know, what is, what is the role of the union in all of this? I think the police unions and collective bargaining should, should be very high on the list of things that, that we are paying attention to and re-examining. Um, I think they impact what we see on the streets and at at least three different levels. So one is that they're a force in electoral politics. Um, they collect a lot of money and they make large um, political contributions that in some localities, depending on uh, the political breakdown can sway elections and, and always in favor of more of what we would call law and order uh, politicians who are going to be less inclined to hold the police accountable and more inclined to support um, the police no matter what they're doing. Um, and then the second level would be at the policy level. So um, if you want to, the may, let's say you get a new mayor comes in or a new police chief and says, um, I want to change things. I want to change the use of force policy and restrict um, the circumstances in which my officers can use a taser or use a firearm, um, usually they have to get that past the union and the union is going to resist it and they're going to write off ads about it and they're going to take out billboards about it and um, they're going to make, uh, try to make citizens feel like they're uh, going to be at risk uh, of crime uh, if, the, if this new mayor pushes through this policy and you know handcuffs the police, so to speak. And they've been very effective 
um, at impeding policy level reforms. Also with respect to hiring, um, uh, they have been um, consistently opposed to hiring preferences that might uh, help to diversify uh, police forces. And then at the third and maybe most important level, um, they bargain for all sorts of procedural protections um, that make it difficult to succeed in investigations against them. Uh, and even when you do succeed, uh, that make it possible for them to be reinstated at an alarmingly high rate. In, in Minnesota, um, a recent study looking at five years of arbitration decisions found that officers who had been terminated um, got themselves reinstated by a labor arbitrator 50% of the time. Uh, and I won't go into great detail, but that 50% number uh, might not be a coincidence. Um, the way that we pick arbitrators uh, incentivizes the arbitrators to rule for each side about 50% of the time, um, because then they can get more work in the future. And if they rule for the chief 90% of the time, then the union's never going to agree to arbitrate in front of them again. So they split the baby and about I would expect in most places about half of the officers who are terminated uh, are reinstated. This is, this is a huge problem. Police chiefs uh, in most places are not running around trying to cut uh, officers loose for minimal infractions. So if a chief fires you and, and, and gets it through internally, um, not every time, but, uh, but most of the time, uh, you probably did something pretty bad. And the fact that you can get reinstated 50% of the time is a problem. So we need to revisit this. There's a lot of different steps that we could take. I mean, I've heard people say abolish police unions. You know, let's remember they also bargain uh, about wages and benefits and length of shifts and things like this that maybe we think as uh, workers they should be able to bargain for. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to let them bargain over uh, uh, these kind of disciplinary procedures. And at the very least, it doesn't mean we have to let them bargain for those procedures behind closed doors. And we could bring those negotiations out into the open uh, which would allow the public to weigh in and express, at least at this moment, it would seem express uh, disapproval uh, of the city uh, allowing the unions to obtain these kinds of protections that impede accountability. Thank you. Um, so Professor Siegler, I think there are a couple of questions that were in the Q&A function you wanted to, to uh, respond to about what judges and perhaps what prosecutors can, can do on these, on these issues. Sure. Yeah, I just want to also join what Professor Conyers and Starr and Futterman all said, um, which is, you know, the reason we have police violence, the reason we have mass incarceration, it's because of racism, whether you call it intentional or implicit or whatever. The fact is the people in power, the police and the, and the judges and the prosecutors and the legislators, they just don't fundamentally see the human beings at the receiving end of the system as their own brothers and sons and fathers, right? They, they, there's some otherizing that goes on and, and people are treated accordingly. Um, and I, I just think it's so important to recognize that fundamental premise from which all of this starts. You know, Cornell West called this out in his forward to the new Jim Crow. He said, there's no doubt that if young white people were incarcerated at the same rates as young black people, the issue would be a national emergency. Um, and I do think that state courts can play a major, major role in the change, you know, our criminal legal system is full of constitutional rights, like in name alone, where they're like virtually unenforceable in practice, right? So Batson is an example, which, you know, you have a right to a race neutral jury selection process, but actually the right is unenforceable. And one thing that's been happening is state Supreme Courts have been stepping in. So the Washington State Supreme Court created a new court rule that provides a much stronger protection against race discrimination and jury selection than the absurdly, you know, like hard to meet constitutional standard. Um, and I think the same mechanism could be used by state courts, a state court rule to address race discrimination by the police, especially I've thought about it in, you know, in criminal cases, I have an article coming out on this, like theoretically, there's an equal protection right. You know, the police are forbidden from discriminating on the basis of race and arresting somebody but it's a right without a real remedy. And it's like not even, it's virtually impossible to even get discovery to pursue a claim of race discrimination by the police in a criminal case. Um, so my, like what I really think state courts can do um, is they can change the discovery standard, they can change the merit standard for this kind of claim, a claim of race discrimination by the police in arresting somebody where you no longer would need to have this kind of smoking gun admission by police 
or prosecutors that they're being um, that they're being racist. Um, and this is something you know where state courts can go way beyond the constitutional standard, the existing constitutional rule, which is often um, fairly unenforceable. So I think that's an interesting avenue of reform there. Uh, thank you. Um, so, let, let, so Professor Starr, I think there was a question in the list you wanted to answer. You want to tell us what the question is and then address it. You're still muted. Unmute myself. Um, um, so I just wanted to, th there's a bunch of questions in the queue about um, changing police culture generally. And, and um, uh, there, like there was one from uh, Jane, for instance, about the, um, uh, the kind of depth of uh, the pervasiveness in the Buffalo Police Department, for example, like all of the, um, the officers walking out to support their um, you know, violent and sociopathic um, um, uh, colleagues receiving any form of justice whatsoever. Um, um, like, it, it has bec become my view that, so I, I, th I think that, um, I think that a, although I, I actually support the, the, the goal of defunding the police in the sense of moving um, uh, money away from the police uh, and toward other um, other social programs so that the police's role is narrowed. I think that's essential. Um, I actually think that um, a problem is that it's maybe too narrow a slogan because it doesn't speak to another thing that we might need, which is personnel changes, right? Like the um, Like we need to be able to get rid of bad cops a lot more easily. And we may need in some departments where the culture of supporting your colleagues no matter what they do suffuses everything. Um, we may need more than just trying to pluck out bad apples. We really may need to sort of start from the ground up with just new people, right? And, and that actually may require a little bit more money rather than less money at first, because I think with union contracts and stuff, if you want to get, if you wanted to try to get, say, hundreds of police officers to um, walk away without fighting you to the death in court, you might have to, you might have to give them buyouts of some, um, of some sort, for instance, to get out of the, um, uh, the, the union contracts that, um, that you've got. Um, but I, I sort of think that, um, you know, in a culture where uh, people can see, you know, their colleagues uh, knock someone over and uh, let them bleed out on the ground and, um, and, and then a hundred other people just walk right over them and one person stops to help and, and that person gets scolded by their colleagues. Like you have something systematic wrong that um, that I feel like maybe the department is is too broken to fix from within. I also want to say that in terms of rooting out uh, bad apples or bad orchards or whatever, um, I, I think police chiefs, if they're at all serious um, about accountability, they need to be reviewing systematically um, everybody's body cam footage from um, from the last several weeks, um, and um, as well as uh, videos submitted by civilians, um, and just and firing everybody that they see. Um, assaulting protesters, uh, um, attacking members of the media, slashing tires, like all of this stuff that has captured America's attention, like uh, there should be a zero tolerance policy. And, um, and uh, we have been very, that police departments have been very bad about actually implementing a zero tolerance policy. Um, I also think legislatures should pass a law, uh, last, pass laws prohibiting their police departments from hiring people who have been fired by other departments for misconduct, which is a problem that um, Professor Rappaport's research has pointed to. Um, okay, that's. Thank you. I apologize to the panelists who I didn't get to return to as frequently as I wanted to and to the, the attendees who posed some very uh, excellent questions and deep questions and 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 um, you know and challenging questions um, that I wish we had time to get to, but where time has expired, um, we will be continuing to address this at the issue at the law school. We're planning uh, a series of uh, summer discussion, faculty-led discussions, uh, which I think we'll be communicating about. Uh, um, in the coming weeks. Um, and so thank, thanks everyone for coming in. I, I don't, we have 
anyone want to have a, a final word? Tom? Dean? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I just, I just want to express my thanks to you for organizing this event and for your skillful hosting and engaging all of our panelists and bringing out so many excellent questions. I also want to express my thanks to all our panelists and faculty commentators. I'm grateful for your joining us, especially on short notice and sharing your expertise and your insights. I hope everybody who was on this webinar is as impressed as I am by the depth of knowledge and insights and the range of perspectives we have on the fact uh, here on the faculty. Um, yeah, even though we've gone over time, we really just scratched the surface. These are complex problems. And I think we're fortunate to have so many brilliant minds on our faculty addressing the dimensions of this complex problem. And I want to thank everybody who joined the webinar. Uh, thank you for your questions. As Deputy Dean McAdam said, I'm sorry that we were not able to get to all of them. Uh, the turnout uh, on this webinar, which I think was over 300 people, highlights how important we all recognize the questions we are that we are confronting. So thank you again for joining us. Stay well, everyone. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>